D. There's a lot to know, some things you probably don't expect about how deploying in memory can change things in your database environment in ways you would not suspect. A little bit about me. Let's see if I can get to that slide. Yes, a little bit about me. I'm a DBA for over 20 years. Started with SQL 4.21a on OS2. I know I'm seriously dating myself. I'm crazy about SQL Server and completely obsessed with all things in memory. And if you have any questions about excuse me, about what we discussed today that we don't address in the presentation or questions outside of the presentation topic related to in-memory, please contact me. My contact info will be displayed later in the presentation. Hey, Ned, one yes. second. Um, yes. For some reason, the control panel is showing. Can you just click ah. the orange thingy? Yes. How's that? Um, oh, much better. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. I, I, no, no, it's not your fault. It shouldn't be showing. I don't know why. I was is. told those things are never visible, but we, we fixed it for now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. The key takeaways for today are recovery in general, specifically recovery time objective, RTO, is impacted by durable memory optimized data in your database. Corruption, all DBAs want to know how to handle or be aware of corruption in their databases, and things are different in that regard for in-memory. And what I call container management, which is a container is just a fancy name for a folder that holds the files that persist your durable memory optimized data. We'll get into that in a moment. What makes a database memory optimized? Well, of course, you start out with a DB, you have to add a special memory optimized file group and that is logically associated with one or more containers and as I said a moment ago that's just a fancy name for a folder in those folders or containers reside the data and Delta files otherwise known as checkpoint file pairs that persist your durable data in memory this data is of a streaming variety it is not stored in pages and extents like hard drive based tables it is streaming like file stream like file table. And the key factor to understand is that it's not possible to set maximum sizes for the data delta files, containers, or file group. Your volumes have to have enough space for this stuff to grow. I want to discuss briefly what they call file merge because it's critical to discussing restore and recovery later on. And data files here are in blue, delta files are in red. A delta file stores entries that are logically deleted in the data file is a one-to-one -one relationship and you'll see for instance the middle set of files which is 201 to 300 that has more logically deleted entries than the others the red delta file is taller and over time that impacts your query performance and your storage footprint so there's this garbage collection process known as file merge that attempts to merge adjacent sets of de data and delta files. Only adjacent sets could possibly mer be merged and they're merged into one set that encompasses the entire transaction range. Like that. Now this does not happen instantaneously. It happens through checkpoints and transaction log backups. And that's why the on-disk fo storage footprint for your data and delta files can be much larger than what's persisted or existing in memory. We'll talk about capacity planning a little bit later. But this is the basic way that file merge works. You can force garbage collection, meaning file merge in this case, with this extremely long system procedure. In case, let's say, your volumes got out, ran out of space and you need to force, you don't want to wait for checkpoints and transaction log backups. Although, you probably, I'm pretty sure you still have to do T log backups to make this work. What do you need memory for? You need it for data, for indexes, and the growth of data and indexes, and row versions, depending on your workload. Now, if you're not familiar with row versions, you should look at the presentation we did last week. We cover it there. Row versions are created, of course, when you insert a row initially. That would be the first version. And if your workload is, let's say, insert and delete only, then you never create subsequent row versions. Therefore, you would need less memory in that situation for your workload as opposed to if your workload was insert update delete because updates in the background create additional row versions. Microsoft doesn't know about your workload so they suggest capacities that will give you enough wiggle room 
that you could maybe tweak later, but basically row version generation depends on your workload. Assuming for a moment that we're not in enterprise because now in-memory is supported on non-enterprise editions, as you add data to the in-memory component, all of this data, sorry, all of this memory comes out of the default pool, then that puts pressure on the buffer pool which can respond to that pressure by shrinking and under normal circumstances if you then deleted data the buffer pool could grow back the other way sorry but uh, what if it just stays there what if you added enough data that it shrank the buffer pool and it just stayed in the shrunken state that could affect your your hard drive based workload and that's something you would rather not happen there's nothing really you can do about this for non-enterprise versions but for enterprise you can use resource governor you would create a pool a resource pool you would bind the database to that pool and then you'd have to offline and online your database in order for that binding to take effect this allows you to monitor the database that you bound to the pool now it is possible to bind multiple databases to the same pool I don't recommend that because you lose the ability to monitor on a per database level so for enterprise, it's a best practice to create a pool and bind a database individual to individual pools. There are three types of indexes for memory optimized tables. Non-clustered is the phrase that is used in documentation, but it's a little confusing because a hash index is also a form of non-clustered index. So I prefer the term range, but that's not Microsoft's official term. So you have range indexes, hash indexes, and clustered column store indexes. We won't have enough time to cover clustered column store today, but I do have a blog post about the differences between CCI for in-mem versus CCI for hard drive-based tables. A range index is best for inequality predicates, greater than, equal to, less than, equal to, not equal to, between, those kinds of predicates. And just like a non-clustered index for hard drive-based tables, it grows with the amount of data inserted and deleted. So it grows dynamically. You don't have to maintain anything about a range index. Hash indexes are specifically for equality predicates. They will not work or cannot be used to satisfy inequality predicates. So that's a key difference. But they are faster for equality predicates than the same type of equality predicate for a range index. They are static. You create something called a bucket count that's associated with a hash index. And that bucket count is static. And as a result, over time, you could have more rows than are healthy for the current bucket count. And you'd have to adjust the bucket count. If you don't, your performance can suffer. If you need rows returned in order, most people do, a hash index cannot do that. You will get, I, I can't say you'll get a table scan, that's probably incorrect there, but what will happen is there'll be a sort operator in your query plan. So forget about that word table scan there. I'll fix that to the subsequent versions of this presentation. A range index can return rows in order, but if you need to return rows in ascending and descending order, a single range index cannot satisfy that. You would need multiple indexes, one ascending and one descending. And given that in 2016 we have a limit of eight non-clustered indexes which comprises range or hash plus one CCI for memory optimized tables, you probably don't want to consider creating multiple in range indexes just to satisfy your order by. That maximum number of indexes is lifted in SQL 2017 but not in 2016. A hash index must a predicate against it must use all key columns this is one of the things that hangs up a lot of people when they use hash indexes they think they can use the technique that we use for hard drive based tables which is to query based on the leading column of a multi key column multi key sorry multi key multi column key i should say it correctly so if you have first name comma last name as your as your keys then you only can uh, search on a hash index for first name comma last name you can't do just a first name predicate a range index does not suffer from that potential issue so you see range indexes are simpler there's no effective max key length for a hash index 
And range indexes have a max of 2,500 bytes, which is massively long. I don't know why anybody would come anywhere close to that number, but it is possible. You'll probably run out of max columns that you can have for a number of uh, keys, key columns. That's, I believe, 32, way before you hit 2,500 bytes, but it is possible. All indexes are covering an a row resides at a location in memory and indexes navigate to that location and therefore the row exists in its entirety there and there's no concept of a covering query where the select columns and the predicate columns are embodied in an index all in sorry all columns are available to you once you get to the row so they're all covering microsoft documentation says that no modifications are logged for indexes on memory optimized tables and I do have an asterisk here because that is true for range and hash indexes it is not true for clustered column store indexes those are logged and they are persisted in your data files and the reason for that is that it takes way too long to create a CCI on the fly if you need to restore or recover your database other indexes like hash and range indexes are rebuilt upon the fly they're not persisted at all the minimum number of indexes we can have for a memory optimized table is one and if that table is specified as durable then that then you need a primary key on that table max indexes we discussed it will be the ceiling will be lifted for 2017 i want to go over file stream briefly because there's some confusion about this now the file stream feature itself is not supported for memory optimized tables you cannot migrate a table from your hard drive based table that uses file stream into in memory and expect to use file stream but you could use the file stream feature for hard drive based tables within the same database within the same memory optimized database that's fully supported you just have two different types of streaming data in 2014 file stream was used to manipulate or manage the files in the containers and that proved to be a performance bottleneck so it was redesigned for 2016 and as a result only the container itself uses some aspect of file stream but basically you don't need to enable file stream in order to use in memory and the anything that has to do with the file stream aspect is handled in the background by the engine itself so it's hands off for DBAs we talked about file stream before we get to restore and you'll see why in a moment restore is different for memory optimized databases a loose kind of 10,000 foot view overview of what happens when a database is restored with memory optimized data would be this the first thing is that it would the process would create the files whether those are traditional files meaning MDF NDF and LDF or and or data and Delta files those files must be created on disk and the next thing would be to copy data from the backup into those files. And if you restore your database with no recovery, you have achieved these two steps. But for memory optimized databases, there is an additional step, and that is to stream the data from storage back into memory. If you restore a database with recovery or don't specify recovery, the default is recovery, your data will be streamed. And this has massive impl implications for restore in general. Just to be clear, when you restore a database, it performs a free space check on the volumes in which the files would be created. And if the check is OK, then it goes further to actually create the files. So it will short circuit the restore process if there is not enough free space on the volumes where you would restore to. For streaming, we would hope that there's a process that verifies if there's enough memory to stream your data from disk into memory. But unfortunately, there is not. That is unfortunate because your restore will fail after, let's say we have a five terabyte durable memory optimized database. It will spend the amount of time it needs to spend to create those five TB files on disk. And let's say you had 4.99 terabytes of memory it will stream 4.99 terabytes of data to memory and then it will fail and you would love to have found out immediately that you did not have enough resources to restore this database if you think Microsoft should fix this and I don't know why any DBA wouldn't 
then I have created a connect item that you should upvote, which I'll be displaying later in the presentation. Smart DBAs might think, okay, I'll just look in my backup file itself with file list only and see what's going on there, and I'll know exactly how much memory I need to restore this database. And that might work out, but it might not work out because within the database backup, all types of streaming data are just listed with a type S. And in this case, which is a kind of contrived extreme example, you can't tell if you need 60 gigabytes or 30 gigabytes to restore this database because one of these types of data is file stream data and the other is memory optimized data. So naming conventions are key to understanding what the heck is in your backups, which is now, shall we say, not complicated, but there's more to it than it used to be when you only had file stream or file table data as streaming. Now you have streaming memory optimized data. The recovery process that includes streaming, this would be a simplified example. It's going to stream the data from the container on a volume to memory. But again, if you have five terabytes of data, you won't want to do this. You'll want to do something like this. Multiple containers spread across multiple volumes. You'll have to go through a trial and error process to determine if you can make your RTO. And if you can't, then you need more containers on more volumes. So this is the part of deploying in memory that affects database design, meaning how many containers you have and where they are stored, and also impacts your storage, because you will need additional volumes. What can cause data to be restreamed? It's not only restore. If you offline a database, for instance, to bind it to a memory opt sorry, to bind it to a resource pool, if to, to have the binding take effect, then you will restream all your data. If you change from read committed snapshot isolation on or off, you will be a restreaming, sir. If you change from read only to read write or back the other way, read write to read only, you are again streaming. Of course, if you restore your database, you must stream the data. If you restart SQL Server, the service, you will restream. And this goes for all memory optimized databases. And of course, if you boot the server, which causes a SQL service restart, you will be restreaming. When a database is recovered, range slash um, non-clustered indexes are rebuilt on the fly. Hash indexes are rebuilt on the fly, but as we said before, CCI, cluster column store indexes are not rebuilt on the fly, and that is to speed recovery. Potential recovery issues are that it could be CPU bound. For instance, in 2016, if you had Eight indexes, which is the max you can have outside of a CCI, on a very large table, a table that had a very large amount of rows in memory, it would take much longer to rebuild those indexes in addition to restreaming the data than if you had just a single index. In addition to that, if you have a lot of lob columns, because now that's supported in 2016, they're stored as separate tables in memory that are associated with the table that they belong to, but lobs can have performance implications in memory. So you could be CPU bound because of that. If your hash indexes have an incorrect or poorly configured bucket count, all this data has to be reinserted into tables. And just like any other time you insert data into a table that has a poorly configured hash bucket count, it can be slower. There's a big difference between FCIs and AGs in terms of whether or not data is restreamed. If you fail over in an FCI from node A to node B, it's no different than a standalone. The SQL service is restarted on that new node and all the databases have to go through recovery and all data must be restreamed. But for AGs, that's not true. There's a big advantage for using AGs with regard to a lot of durable memory optimized data because as redo occurs on the secondaries, whether or not those secondaries are readable or not, Redo keeps the data in memory up to date, assuming that your storage can keep up with Redo. So theoretically, for a large amount of durable memory optimized data, AG failover will be much faster than FCI failover. Piecemeal restore is used to look at just a piece of a larger database. And if your database architecture is such that you've broken your data out to file groups, you could, for a piecemeal restore, simply restore your primary file group and let's say you wanted to look at 
the most recent quarter file group. Now with memory optimized databases, you must also restore the memory optimized file group whether or not you want to look at it. And that means you could be waiting a lot longer than you had done so in the past to look at quarter one files group, file groups data. Before I move forward, uh, Ami, are there any questions? Oops. Maybe Ami's on. Yeah. No, oh, no, no, I'm here. Um, no, no questions uh, so okay. far. Maybe this okay. is a reminder to everybody. If you have a question, please use the questions um, control in your control panel. Okay. okay. Moving on to corruption, all DBAs would like to know that their data is free from corruption and their database is corruption free. And for hard drive based workloads or hard drive based tables in a database, we have a number of options to detect and recover from corruption. You can run check DB, check table, you can do page level restores for mirroring or AGs. You can recover data from non-clustered indexes. You can hack attach a database if you're Paul Randall or someone that follows him, you know how to do that. And you can restore a database without a log by telling the database engine to rebuild the log. This is specific to hard drive based tables. Once you introduce memory optimized excuse me, once you introduce memory optimized tables to a database, you can do none of those things to this database. I should say you can run CheckDB for memory optimized in a memory optimized database, but it will ignore memory optimized tables. So you can still run it. It will still verify your hard drive based tables. You can try to run check table against a memory optimized table, but it will fail. You'll get an error. And because memory optimized data is not persisted at the page level, there's no pages. It's persisted in a streaming fashion. There's no such thing as page level restore. And the other things that you could do to recover from corruption, you cannot do. But you can still detect corruption, but in order to do that, we'd have to understand a little bit more about how the data is stored in the streaming files. To be clear, CheckDB verifies your primary file group and your secondary file groups and tertiary, etc., everything except your memory optimized file group, just to be clear. So you run CheckDB, it's still checking your hard drive based environment. Data that is written to data and delta files is written at the block level and a checksum is calculated for that block and stored with the block and any process that causes the block to be read again recalculates the checksum and compares it to the stored checksum value with the block and if there's a mismatch you have corruption it's not checking for corruption in memory you can also have corrupted memory this doesn't verify that this verifies files that resist that sorry that exist on storage. They sometimes resist, but they definitely exist on storage. And this is to make sure that your data and delta files are not corrupt. So if you do a SQL backup, it will validate the checksums for all of your data and delta files, assuming that is a full backup. Because a full backup go goes through and reads through every file in your database and if it's a memory optimized related file, it validates the checksums. If it's a differential, it only validates the checksums for the files, the memory optimized files that have changed. So that may not be what you want. Let's say you did a weekly full and a daily diff. Well, six days out of seven, you don't know if the rest of your data has some kind of corruption in your data and delta files. You would need to do a full backup every day, which may not work for larger databases. So we'll talk about how to get around that in a moment. If you use SAND snapshots, of course, there's no checksum validation that occurs. Brent Ozar has a post about this. And what can you do? You can do this CheckDB alternative. If you do daily diff differential backups and weekly fulls, or if you use SAND snapshots, on a daily basis, you can back up your memory optimized file group, because it's just like any other file group. It can be backed up at its level to disk equals null, which is just a bit bucket. It doesn't have a representation on storage with copy only so you don't break your log backup chain and this will force rereading and recalculating of checksums for all of your memory optimized related files so whether or not you do a full backup every day rather if you do a full backup every day and it's not a, and it's a SQL server backup you don't need to do this but if you do a weekly full and a daily diff then you do need to do this and you need to do that in all your environments whether it's secondary AGs or primary 
So this is an alternative to CheckDB that can be run on a daily basis to verify. If corruption is detected, let's say during file merge, or what's known as regular processing, then you get this specific error in the error log, which you should be trapping for, just like 823, 824, 825, other storage-related corruption issues. You should trap for these errors. During backup and restore, if, it, if corruption is detected, check some mismatch, it has a different error. And for database recovery, if you restart a database, these are the three errors that you need to trap for. You can't do anything about it except be alerted. You could then get your data out of your memory optimized structures into disk-based tables, maybe move them to another database, but you can't correct the, the corruption within the original database. DBAs often need to move data around, and in-memory is no exception. Depending on the size of the data you need to migrate, this could be an issue. If your data source, your source tables are compressed, index or table or row or column store compressed, then the storage footprint that they occupy it will, is much smaller than what you will need capacity-wise in memory. So you need to be aware of that. I'm going to shell out for a moment and go to the Memory Optimization Advisor which you can see if you right-click a table and go to Memory Optimization Advisor. It comes up with this, I'll try and make this larger, it comes up with this thing that verifies, a dialog box that verifies your table and assuming you were to click through this, I'll get out of this, it generates a script similar to what we have in front of us now. It first attempts to, if you wanted to migrate your data, it attempts to rename the original object to underscore OLD then it goes to your memory optimized database and attempts to create the memory optimized table. And then it attempts to insert into that table by selecting all rows from your source table on disk. Now, if you don't have a lot of rows, this will be fine. But if you have 50, 60, 70 million rows to migrate, you will grow old. You have to find a way to break this into parallel processes, just like any other kind of bulk loading process. So this is a kind of gotcha that you can be lulled into a false sense of security with the GUI, thinking, oh, I'll just click through this thing and I won't even generate a script. It's going to just take care of my migration for me. This will be very slow. It's possible, but it'll be very slow. Let's go back to our presentation. Oops. We'll have to find my way here. Sorry. Okay, we talked about that. So, we talked about the Memory Optimization Advisor. Select into is not supported for memory optimized tables, therefore you can't do any kind of minimal logging when you move data from disk to memory. As a result, your transaction log can get very large very quickly. And again, if you have hash indexes on the destination table in memory and your buck account is not properly configured, your inserts will be very slow. Which leads us to recovery model. We did talk about this last week as well, but it's relevant to this part of the conversation. In terms of DML, for memory optimized tables, recovery model is irrelevant. All DML for durable memory optimized tables is fully logged, and it, it does not respect the recovery model for your database. You can still have bulk logged activity occur for hard drive based tables. It will respect that if you're in bulk logged mode. But DML, inserts, update, deletes for memory optimized tables are always fully logged and there's nothing you can do about that. If you need to move data from a hard drive based table to a memory optimized table within the same database, there are no restrictions on doing that. I have an asterisk next to that middle row uh, next to disk because it is possible to create a memory optimized table that is so large that you cannot actually migrate it to a hard drive based table. That would be extreme, but it is possible. If you need to go cross database, that's not directly supported. There's an extra hoop you have to jump through, or a couple of hoops. One way to go cross database would be in your source database, you create a memory optimized table variable. Now that variable can be visible from different databases, not just the source database. Inserting to that variable from your source table, whether that's a disk table or a memory optimized table. So now your variable has your data. And then you could insert into your destination memory optimized table by 
in the target database by selecting from the memory optimized table variable. This pattern suffers from the same issue as the script that the GUI generated. If you have tons of data, this will be slow. But you could do this for a range of rows and, and then have multiple processes just migrate their own ranges. In this scenario, you need twice the amount of memory because you need one set of memory for the table variable and one for the destination table to hold the rows. So you could have memory issues. Need a total of 2x. The tried and true BCP utility should be able to BCP out and BCP in. I've not tested that, but I believe it works. That's simple. I prefer something like this, where you, in the source database, select into a global temp table, create an index on the key columns, and that allows you, and some people might not realize, the tempdb is visible to memory optimized databases as long as you don't use native compilation. That's what makes this work. Then in your source, sorry, your target database, you would insert it into your memory optimized destination table by selecting from the global temp table where key between some value, and this would allow you to have multiple SQL command sessions or PowerShell sessions that call SQL command or store procedures that you executed from the command line. So you could parallelize your data load, which is, after all, that's what you want to do. There's no possibility of locking or blocking when these rows are inserted from 10 or 100 or 1,000 different connections because the in-memory engine does not use locks. As an example, I did some benchmarking on my own hardware in my own lab, and you can see once I got to the bat size of about 1,000, it kind of tapered off. I could get about 5 million rows in for one session in about 13 seconds, and then I got to two sessions that, that went to 17 seconds, but once you got to three sessions, the beauty of in-memory is displayed here because this write-intensive, highly concurrent workload scaled. It was the same duration for an extra 5 million rows. So I inserted 15 million rows in 17 seconds. That's pretty blazing fast. You could not do that with the traditional hard drive-based engine. Security is paramount for DBAs in general, but in-memory opens up other questions about security. We have support for always encrypted and TDE within memory. We'll talk about the asterisk for TDE in a moment. But let's get to the DLLs. Actually, DLLs are generated as a result of compiling tables and native modules, whether those are store procedures, functions, or triggers. The binaries that are used to create those DLLs are protected through access control lists. The DLLs that are generated are immediately linked to sqlserver.exe, and once you link a DLL, you cannot touch it. And upon database restart, if anyone tampered with the DLLs, it won't have any effect because the existing DLLs are not used, they're blown away, and new DLLs are created on the fly. So essentially your tables and natively compiled modules are recompiled upon database restart. Transactional log latency can be a big deal in general, but especially once you remove the engine as the bottleneck for write intensive, highly concurrent workloads, then it could be that your transa transaction log starts to fall over and you get a lot of write log weights. It's often either the top weight or one of the top weights once you remove the engine as the bottleneck. There's a hardware-based solution that can solve this problem. The one I know of is specific to HP and it's something called persistent memory, otherwise known as server class memory. It is implemented with a special kind of memory chip known as an NVDIM. What can it do? How does it do it? The chip has two sides. It has a memory side and a storage side. So first your data goes into DRAM, and then if there was a power issue, it would be copied to flash. There's a power source, either a super cap or a battery. And when and what is stored there are log blocks. And a log block or a set of log blocks for a database only needs about 20 megabytes. That's MB megabytes. An NVDIM, I believe the lowest capacity is 8 gigabytes, so you could store the log blocks for multiple memory-optimized databases on this NVDIM. And then when there's a power failure, a system power failure, the power for the source for this NVDIM takes over and copies the log blocks to flash, where, at least through my research, it is determined that they could last there for years. 
hopefully you won't be down that long. And upon power up, then the log blocks are copied back to DRAM. I don't have access to NVDIMs and HP servers, but my good friend Thomas Grozer does. He can be reached at that email address, and he was kind enough to allow me to use the results of his tests in this presentation. First of all, NVDIMs can be formatted two ways. One is with the operating system format, and that is block mode, and that is about one and a half times faster than a PCIe slot. That is super fast, but nowhere near as fast as SQL Server formatting, which results in what they call DAX format, which ends up being about three times faster than a PCIe slot. This should eliminate all transaction log bottlenecks from your system. But as usual, the devil is in the details. Thomas likes to max out his servers with load-reduced DIMMs. Now, if you use all LR DIMMs in every slot in your server, because they're load-reduced, they can operate at the maximum speed of 2400 and you will end up with 1.5 terabytes, let's say for HP DL380, which is what he tested on. But there's a problem. Once you introduce NVDIMs, you have incompat incompatibilities, and you cannot use load-reduced DIMs. But you can use registered DIMs. This is compatible, but the capacity is reduced. And there are other issues. Once you fill up all the slots, if that's what you do, in an HP DL380, it no longer operates at the maximum speed that it could. It operates at 1866, which is considerably slower than 2400. And if your workload was based on queries as opposed to data ingestion, your queries might be a lot slower at 1866 as opposed to 2400. And of course, this reduces the capacity. So if your workload is data ingestion only, then you don't care about the speed. You just want it to be as blazing fast as possible, and NVDIMs could solve that problem for you. So again, I'd like to thank Thomas for letting us use these slides. We had an asterisk next to TDE when we talked about security related to persistent memory. That's because if you use TDE, you cannot use persistent memory. TDE is I.O.-based encryption, and that doesn't work for NVDIMs because the data jumps off the CPU right to the DIM directly. It doesn't go through the regular I.O. path and cannot therefore be encrypted. So these are mutually exclusive. Either you use persistent memory or you use TDE. Alter table did not exist in 2014, now exists in 2016 and beyond, and it is great, but has a few things you need to be aware of as a DBA. Generally speaking, most things that you could do with alter table will be executed in parallel and, and minimally or metadata only logged. This did not exist in 2014. Everything you did was executed serially and fully logged. And so this is a great change for DBAs in 2016. Keep in mind that your object is offline during the duration of the alter. And if you had any schema, any natively compiled modules, they must be schema bound and you would have to script them first, drop them, alter your table, and then recreate them after the alter as you would have to do with any schema bound object. And this alter command is going to use two times the amount of memory. It's going to leave your initial table intact, copy it to a new set of memory, and you need 2x memory while this occurs. So that for a large table could be uh, a lot of resources. But there are some exceptions to this slide which would cause alter table to be serially executed and fully logged. And my suggestion, and I will mention this several times during this presentation, is that any alter table you do on a table that is of reasonable size should be tested somewhere else in a non-production environment first, because you don't want to find out in production that it'll be going serial and fully logged. If you add or alter a variable length lob column, you will have serial execution and full logging. Same for adding and dropping a column store index. Column movement. Now, key columns for an index must reside within the row, within the first 8,060 bytes. When a table is created, the in-memory engine decides at create table time whether a column is stored off row or not. If you decided to create an index on a column that the engine had stored off row, now must be stored in row, you will have serial execution and full logging. So that's one potentially big gotcha. That's why you need to test somewhere else. And if you create a new off-row column, same thing. So there's a few exceptions to the 
previous slide that you would like to avoid or at least be aware of. Statistics are still vital, even in the in-memory world. You can create them manually or automatically. You can update them manually or automatically depending on your compatibility level. For automatic updating, your compatibility level has to be at least 130, which is SQL 2016 level. And of course, you can manually update them with update statistics. Now, if we were to remove memory optimized, the memory optimized universe for a moment and you updated statistics or created indexes, which also create statistics, or dropped indexes, which changes the types of statistics that are available for a regular stored procedure, an interpreted stored procedure against regular hard drive-based tables, then those activities will invalidate or could invalidate the plan in the cache. And as a result, upon next execution, the plan would be recompiled. But natively compiled modules are not stored in the plan cache and therefore cannot be invalidated. It's up to you, the DBA, to know that when you've added a lot of data and that caused you to want to update stats, you also have to manually recompile all of your native modules. And that goes for AG primaries, AG secondaries. There's nothing I can determine that will cause automatic recompilation of native modules anywhere in SQL Server in 2016. I have not been able to figure out if it's possible yet. And my testing has indicated that it's not possible. So it's another thing that a DBA has to do, maintenance-wise. Speaking of maintenance, DBAs will love in memory for index maintenance reasons because there's no such thing as fragmentation, there's no such thing as fill factor, and there's no such thing as reorganize. So these things you can remove from your palette. It's good. There are things that need to be reorganized that can be done in other ways for CCI, but we won't cover that today. What you might need to do is rebuild the bucket count for a hash index. That is a maintenance thing that is requires human interaction. Probably you could find a way to automate it once the row count or the, the amount of unique values in a table is less than, sorry, once the bucket count is less than two times that amount, you could probably have something that triggers an automatic rebuild, but you, a human, need to create that script. Container management. Well, people don't think about this now because people are just starting to deploy in memory now and it's going to be deployed on volumes that have plenty of space. But we need to talk about what happens in the future when maybe that's not true any longer. Just to be clear, you should not do anything with other than maybe have a look at these containers, which are just, as we said before, file, sorry, folders on a, on a hard drive. You shouldn't copy or paste them to or from any place. You shouldn't put any other files in these containers. You should not generally trespass in the containers. You can only have bad things happen as a result. What if you run out of free space on all of your volumes? So we said that you have, let's say, multiple containers on multiple volumes and you cannot constrain the data and delta files or the file group or the container size at all. And now you have zero free space. What will happen? Well, queries will still work. You can still delete data, but you cannot insert or update data. The solution is simple. You simply create a new volume on a new container and your workload will persist, will continue as usual. This is an easy fix. But what if you needed to redistribute the data from your initial set of containers to a new set of containers? Why would you need to do that? First of all, Microsoft documentation says that you cannot drop a non-empty container, nor can you move data and delta file pairs to another container in the memory optimized file group. The first statement is false, the first part of the statement that says you cannot drop a non-empty container. That is false. And also the second part, it says you cannot move data and delta files. That's correct. You cannot, but you can instruct the engine to do so. Let's say your RTO is 30 minutes. You got 50 gigabytes of data that is uh, of space that is used, and your restore time takes 15 minutes, and you're well within your RTO, and that's today. But later, your data grows to 150 gigabytes. You still have plenty of free space on those volumes. That's not an issue. But your restore time, your RTO is now 45 minutes. Your RTO is blown, your SLA is blown, D this gets DBAs fired. 
if you simply add a new container to a new volume, that won't solve your problem because all your data, existing data, still resides on the initial three containers. Your RTO is still going to be the same. Or sorry, your, your restore time will still be the same. What you need to do is something like this. You need to create new volumes on new containers and drop the old volumes on the old containers. Even though the documentation says you cannot do it, you can. I have a blog post about it. I have proven it can be done. And I verify with Microsoft it can be done. You create containers on new volumes. You drop containers on the old volumes. Your database stays online for this. And the engine in the background handles this process. So it can be done. I wanted to briefly cover temporal, if we can. I think we might have enough time to do this. In-memory temporal tables are possible. Old versions end up on a history table on disk. But for memory optimized tables, in, in particular in this case, there's another path that they go through. That is to a secret hidden staging table in memory. And old versions go there first. When this table reaches about 8% the size of the temporal table, there's an async flush to the history table on disk. And that's good. Everything's good. But before the flush, you'd have history on disk and history in memory. And if you want to, and, and there's a single index that's created, and it's a system generated index. If you want to query the history table based on a predicate that is related to the, this only existing index, you'll be good. You'll get a seek. But what if you wanted to create a query that had a different predicate, predicate on different columns? You're scanning this table, this staging in-memory table. And with 8% of the temporal in-memory table size, that could be a lot of rows to scan. SQL 2016 SP1 solves this problem for DBAs. You can create custom indexes. You can create multiple custom indexes on this hidden staging table. But keep in mind that the staging table name is dynamic. It is not static. You will get a seek as a result, and you, you and your users will be happy. It requires a trace flag. The table name is dynamic, so you'd have to handle scripting that. Now imagine if you had 50 temporal memory optimized tables, that you'd have 50 hidden staging tables. So this is a good solution compared to 2016 RTM, but I uh, would like to be a little more hands off. But we, it is what it is, and it's better than it was. You can decide to manually flush the staging table to the hard drive-based history table. And maybe if you do that too often, it's also a problem. But you have control over not waiting for it to get to 8%. Potential index issues would be mostly related to hash indexes, where you'd have wrong bucket counts or searching on a subset of key columns or using inequality predicates. You can check this long DMV at the bottom and verify the chain length for your hash indexes, which will give you an indication about the number should be as low as possible. Otherwise, it has to the engine has to traverse many uh, parts of the chain. Native compilation potential issues could be. Uh, I enjoy. Uh, I prefer to call native or any pro store procedure with this type of format with main parameters. That will be much slower for in-memory natively compiled modules. You need to do ordinal parameters. So not named parameters. There's an X event that catches if people are using name parameters and also if they're not using the correct data types for natively compiled procedures. You can look that up. It's in purple on this slide. So parameter sniffing is not possible. And all joins are nested loop for in-memory. In addition, all I should say all joins are nested loop for natively compiled. And parameter sniffing cannot be done for natively compiled. And natively compiled modules always run serially. Best practices quickly will say 2x times your data set. Workload IOPS times 3, that's to handle file merge. Storage footprint initially should be 4x your, your memory optimized data set size. That's to allow for file merge to go through the state changes. And can your T-log handle the new throughput? Microsoft recommends creating range indexes first then hash indexes, you must, you absolutely must index all foreign keys. Otherwise, you will get repeatable read and serializable uh, isolation validations. And you don't want that. Bucket count, it should be unique values times two if you're using hash indexes. Verify the chain length, as we said. And remember to recompile your natively compiled modules after updating stats or large changes in your data. Configure alerting for checksum failures. 
Now these are just like 1205, which is related to deadlock. These are app-related message, sorry, errors that you should retry if if that's the way you want to handle it. But could be that someone committed uh, an update to a row before you. You're both updating the same row at the same time. It's possible. There's no locking, but they got there before you did. So you need to trap for these kinds of errors. You need to figure out your database and storage design and keep testing your RTO with a full data set until you have achieved your desired RTO. And create documentation and tests for redistributing containers, adding containers, piecemeal restore, anything that in memory might affect that you normally had documentation for. And test your alter table outside of a production environment. These are the connect items that I wish everyone would upvote. The first one is related to not checking um, the amount of memory that's required to actually do the restore. There is an, another connect item I created related to excessive memory usage for table variables. That should be fixed by Microsoft, I think. And this is Brent Ozar's connect item, which is about CheckDB should verify checksums for in-memory tables. Here's what we covered today. RTO, corruption, container management. Those are the three big takeaways. And with that, that's my contact info and blog. I can take questions if there are any, Ami. Yes, so thank you very much for another excellent presentation, Ned. We do have, I believe, one question, which, uh, let me just pop this out so I can see. Oh, um, this is from Yusuf, who has left, um, but he asked, how do you solve the stream issue with memory limitation? Uh, you cannot solve it. You have to have enough memory. Uh, it's a, the only way you can solve it is with resources. You have to give this engine enough resources to do its work. If you run out of memory, you either have to delete data or drop tables that have data. Anyway, you're getting rid of data That's and, and waiting for garbage collection to occur. That's maybe not a solution, but if you get stuck, you could do that. You could copy data to a hard drive-based table first and then delete it from memory. Garbage collection would then free that memory, but the real solution is to not run out of memory, meaning you should have enough resources. Yes, okay. Um, so we have, first of all, a compliment from Christian about the great presentation. And oh, thank you. Dennis asks, hello, will these two presentations be on Ted's blog? Excellent reference source. Um, so the presentations will be, the first one is already on our YouTube channel, and this one is going to be there too um, by tomorrow. Um, all you go, go to imvc.pass.org, go to the meeting archive, and in the meeting archive you'll get links to both the um, presentation slides um, and the link to the YouTube channel with um, with a recording. So I hope, yeah, okay. There, that there was also answer. one script from last week's session that I posted, made a blog post about there. There's nothing to really include script-wise for this week's session, but there is one on my blog post. Okay, great. And your blog post is at nedotter.com. So Correct. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you again, Ned. And I hope to see you with us soon. Uh, we still don't know what's coming up next month. We're currently uh, negotiating with several speakers. But I'll let you know as I soon as I find out. So hold your breath and visit our page regularly. Thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you.